Good afternoon, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this plenary session on fostering connectivity across borders. I'm Melinda Crane, I'm chief political correspondent at Deutsche Welle Television, and it is a great pleasure and honor to accompany you today as moderator. I'd like to start out by putting our subject a little bit in context for us. And that means talking about a topic that has been in the headlines a great deal of late, namely trade. As you know, even before the latest round of trade tensions, trade flows were shifting, and the rate of growth in international trade has slowed compared to the years preceding the financial crisis. So it has become more imperative than ever to look at how we can maximize the benefits of the current flows that we have. When we talk about international commerce, especially of late, we often tend to focus on the dampening effects of tariffs, but a second set of barriers also constrains trade, and that is our topic today, namely challenges and barriers to cross-border connectivity. Trade flows are increasingly dependent on global and regional value chains, yet most infrastructure investments remain domestic. So if we want to maximize the benefits of trade, it is crucial that we work together to enhance cross-border infrastructure. That means both soft infrastructure, such as coordination on customs pr processes, for example, and also hard, meaning physical connectivity across borders uh, at roads and railways. And that's why we decided to devote this session to exploring the positive impact of improved cross-border connectivity on trade flows, to highlighting the challenges of cross-border infrastructure projects, and to showcase lessons learned. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our absolutely outstanding multi-stakeholder panel. It brings together representatives of the private and the public sector, as well as international organizations. And as I introduce you, I will ask you to please come here to the center of the room and take your seats, and you will find that they are marked with your names. So I will begin with His Excellency, uh, Mr. Hicham Ben Ahmed. He is Tunisian Minister of Transport, and with over 20 years in government service, he previously served as State Secretary at both the Transport and the Commerce Ministries. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Excellency, and here is your place right there. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very glad to introduce Desiree Un. She is P policy coordinator and advisor to the European coordinator for the 10T Rhine Danube corridor. Uh, and uh, the coordinator works with the European Commission. And she has agreed to jump in at very short notice for the coordinator herself, who unfortunately, due to transport difficulties, could not be with us here today. So, very warm welcome, Desiree Un, and your seat will be right there there. I'm also very pleased uh, to introduce François Daven. He is Deputy Director General of the International Union of Railways, UIC, and he will become Director General next month. He was previously, previously Secretary General of the Inter Intergovernmental Organization for Carriage by Rail, OTIF, where he promoted partnerships. So, welcome to you, and there is your seat. Thank you. 
And I'm very glad to welcome Anna Inojosa. She works with the World Customs Organization as Director of Compliance and Facilitation, leading a director that's responsible both for securing and for facilitating global supply chains through the simplification and harmonization of customs procedures. And she previously had a long career with the US Customs and Border Protection Service. So that's you Thank right you. there. Welcome to you. We're also glad to have with us Mr. Maximilian Eichhorn. He is Head of Strategy and Business Development with Siemens Mobility, a global market leader in rail and road infrastructure products and systems. He previously served as CEO responsible for Siemens Mobility's Asia Pacific business, where he did extensive work in the area of automation and IT. Great to have you with us. You are right there. Oh, sorry, right there, absolutely. And finally, I'm glad to welcome Mr. Gene Soroka. He is executive director of the busiest container port in North America, namely the Port of Los Angeles. He's responsible for interacting with a wide range of stakeholders, including supply chain partners, labor organizations, and policymakers. And he also serves on the US Department of Commerce's advisory committee on supply chain competitiveness. Great that you could be here with us. Gene Soroka. Ladies and gentlemen, I will just say before we begin, we are also very much looking forward to hearing from you a little bit later on in our discussion. We'll get going here with a few rounds of, of uh, questions and answers uh, and then come to your questions in the last 20 minutes or so. So I'd like to begin by talking about improved connectivity and trade facilitation and identifying some of the challenges in that, so as a kind of an introductory round for our discussion. And the ITF has put together some very fascinating fact nuggets, so I thought I would just throw out a couple of those in t to get us started. First one is this. A new ITF OECD study that focuses on Central Asia shows that improvements in border crossing time would raise the overall traffic flow passing through the region by 11% for road and 2% for rail within the next 30 years. A second uh, fact uh, is that a direct transportation link with trading partners in many cases more than doubles trade and tourism flows. So coming, first of all, then, uh, on the basis of those facts to you, you Minister uh, Ben Ahmed, I'd like to talk just a little bit about where you see challenges to cross-border trade facilitation. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you and I would like to thank uh, all the panelists for being here and welcome them as well as the audience. What is important for us today when it comes to trade facilitation and cross-border transport is the following. Geographically speaking, Tunisia is located between Africa and Europe. And that enables us to take on a very important role when it comes to joint mobility. We try to develop a strategy for mobility, the transport of persons and freight. And in doing so, we try to base our developments on the strategy of hubs, an air hub, a sea hub, a hub for roads, and here we want to involve all the countries around us. When talking about hubs, of course, we have to talk about the exchange of goods and passengers, and this is very, very important. This is a factor of regional integration through industry, and this is the uh, way Tunisia opted for. We have signed a free trade agreement with Europe and we are about to sign another free trade agreement in relation to everything revolving around freight. And we are negotiating another free trade agreement that goes beyond what we have established so far. And we want to include services as well as agriculture. When it comes to Arab and other African countries, it has to be said that we belong to different trade and industry associations and that 
of course, helps us to integrate ourselves on an international level. When it comes to infrastructure, there is an important point to be mentioned because currently we are investing a lot via public-private partnerships. We do investments, uh, we make investments into ports, we are building a large uh, seaport in Tunisia that is surrounded by a relatively large logistics area and apart from traditional airports. We run an airport that we develop right next to the port, also based on a public-private partnership. We will actually uh, expand this airport. It uh, has been in operation for eight, nine years now, and we want to turn it into a true hub. This is our target, and this hub will help us to facilitate trade between Europe and Africa. This is our global strategy, roughly. But... In other areas, we do lag behind when it comes to electrification of rails, for example. We have a degree of electrification of no more than 5%. So here, a strategy is needed for rail transport. And we need a strategy on an international level, an urban level for urban and interurban transport. And then there is another project we're currently working on and we have entered the last assessment stage of this project now, and it is about a high-speed train connection for the Maghreb states, that is Tunisia and the other surrounding countries. Of course, I want to keep this brief, but roughly I have outlined our strategic targets. Enhance and facilitate uh, connectivity in conjunction with those infrastructure projects that you just mentioned. Let me come now to Madame Un and talk a little bit about uh, the Rhine-Danube corridor. Um, you are dealing with the longest river in Europe. There are still important barriers that do impede seamless transport there. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about what those are and what the way forward looks like. So more specifically about the Rhine Danube, it is clear that you have uh, a lack of uh, harmonization of border controls. And you see that this hampers really uh, traffic and trade if uh, cargoes and uh, freight has to be controlled and every time in a different way at, uh, between cross-border, then you have definitely a big obstacle. You also see that there is a lack of staff. What can be done about it? That is, of course, that you have an acceptance of the professional qualifications and you have mutual recognition of all the documents of professional qualification. There needs to be also an, uh, an, an transparency about uh, prices and tariffs. Uh, what is also needed that is lack of maintenance and lack of infrastructure. So if all the riparian countries do their homework and if they will all try to improve their infrastructure and maintain the river, you have, of course, uh, more trade because it is clear when you have a good flow, if you have seamless traffic, uh, then you improve and enhance trade. That is clear. And then, of course, information. That is also one thing that is very specific for the Rhine Danube. You need to give information to all the skippers. So in order for them to ensure uh, a way of planning their uh, freight flows. Could you just say a, a word about the role of corridors uh, in addressing those kinds of barriers and challenges? Do they give you some levers to work with to try, for example, to uh, foster closer partnership and even uh, perhaps uh, induce countries uh, to work together more closely? Mm, absolutely. Actually, the essence is uh, the TNT. The TNT is defining uh, Europe in core networks and in corridors, uh, core, core networks and the comprehensive network. And actually the corridors, these are the instruments to ensure real infrastructure deployment. So this is the leverage. It is clear when you have a corridor, you can see where the obstacle is in a corridor. And there you will see most of the time it is cross-border because the member states like to do 
uh, some works and infrastructure in their own country. But it is always an issue when you have to do it cross-border. Who is going to take the lead? So that is something actually where we have to work and where Carla Pes as coordinator and of course the other coordinators in their corridors uh, play a very big role. Because let's, let's be honest, I mean, it is clear when you have a seamless corridor, it improves the trade because you can move your goods from point A to point B in an efficient way. Thank you very much. Let's uh, stay on the water, uh, so to speak, for a moment and come to uh, uh, the Port of Los Angeles and you, Mr. Soroka. The state of U.S. trade agreements is very fluid, to put it uh, somewhat euphemistically, uh, right now. How has that affected your gateway? And what do you see as the role of trade facilitation against the backdrop of the current uncertainty and political constraints? Well, for the first time in memory, Melinda, we as the United States are negotiating on a 360-degree basis between Mexico and Canada with a new USMCA agreement, with China that has made much of the news in recent months, and still with the European Union on talks that really haven't settled in any particular pathway just yet. So against that backdrop, is the immediacy of the negotiations with China. And the unintended consequences that we have seen are a deluge of import cargo coming through our port complex by US-based importers who want to bring as much inventory in as possible before higher taxation rates go into place. Based on policy and retaliatory tariffs, exports from our nation have dropped precipitously. In fact, in the first quarter of the year, exports through our port to China have dropped by 35%. All of which just exacerbates the gap in trade that we had witnessed in recent years. More cargo coming in and less going out. The impacts of that really hit our efficiencies or lack thereof now at this point in time because we can't match the flow of cargo moving in both directions. With that big surge in import cargo, it hurts the system in that we now have higher dwell times on our assets. Cargo doesn't move as fluidly and tends to sit or gets warehoused in these containers. And of warehousing, of which we have more than 1.8 billion square feet in Southern California, we have less than a 1% vacancy rate today. So our warehouses are really expanded to the seams at this point. So all of that has had a great impact on how quickly we service our customers and how those goods come to market for you and me when we purchase them. Thank you very much. And perhaps just a word beyond the political uh, challenges. Where do you see other challenges that the U.S. does face in global and intra state trade, because of course a lot of trade in the U.S. is with those two land neighbors, but beyond that, where do you, where do you see particular sound challenges? Well, 90% of our world's trade moves on water. So this particular part that we play in international trade is absolutely important to us. The cargo that moves through the Port of Los Angeles reaches each and every one of our 435 congressional districts in the nation. So it truly is, from our vantage point, a conversation of national and international significance. A, com a comprehensive, fully funded, multimodal freight plan from the United States we think is an absolute necessity and one that ties together these 50 states. Uh, the Moving Ahead with Progress Plan number 21 that was brought forward in the last administration really was that stepping stone to build state freight plans into one succinct national plan. That has not been done yet. Having a truly comprehensive infrastructure plan, roads, bridges, airports, seaports, is also something that lags behind, we believe, uh, our competitiveness on the global scale. And lastly, the cross-border activity is now being impacted on the freight side by that policy which is being implemented to our southern borders where many more of our skilled agents have to work that border and are taking time and resources away from our airports and our border activity for trucks. So all of those areas really need to be worked on and with a sense of urgency. Thank you very much.
Let us go on land now and get a railway perspective. And uh, quite simply to you, um, Mr. Duffin, what would you say is key to fostering, it should be on, I'm sure it's on, sir. Yeah. On. What would you say is key to fostering stronger cross-border connectivity in rail? Well, I think in rail, uh, the main issue is actually that we have a two national thinking about uh, our services. Uh, what, what you can see uh, definitely is that if you look at the national networks, there are quite excellent networks. They have good management. There are more or less uh, good uh, intermodal feature. But when it comes to international connections, then we still have problems. And in particular in Europe, there is still a lot of uh, discrepancy uh, between the procedure, between uh, the safety uh, issues, uh, with language issues. For example, uh, in the aviation, uh, you have a very simple principle. It's English and uh, your language if you speak it. But English shall be understood. For example, in freight, you don't have uh, this kind of question. So UIC, as um, International uh, Union of Railways, is committed to um, open, share, and connect between different railways since 1922. So we could say, well, OK, you didn't uh, do that a great job since uh, <laughs> you say that there is still problems. But there is still problems because uh, we are actually turning to be more international, and it's partly due in Europe, uh, due to the action of the Commission, that want to have a single European network. And besides, if you look uh, a little bit further, if you look, for example, to the, let's say, uh, Russian area, uh, they have more integrated procedure, and then you can see that there is um, far better interconnections for rail. And then I think we need, progressively, uh, to enter into the uh, same procedure, same thinking about our network attitudes. Uh, this morning there was this um, ministerial about uh, how to improve connection through uh, telecommunication in a way recipe. And uh, that's exactly, uh, I think, what should be the aim of the industry to try to have a network thinking internationally. Can you say just a little bit about what your levers are at UIC for trying to promote and strengthen both internal and external interfaces? So our traditional aim in uh, UIC is to issue uh, operational standards that we call IRS, International Railway Solution. It used to be uh, UIC leaflets. And basically, uh, we are trying to provide solution. For example, for ticketing, it's based on uh, UIC uh, applications that you can have indeed global ticketing in Europe uh, and actually seamless ticketing. We also, for freight, uh, are running an agreement that allows the wagons to be exchanged all over the Europe. So that's this kind of operational feature that uh, we are trying to uh, offer uh, to the sector. And indeed, that's very important for rail because rail is, first of all, a network and is a network for mass transit. So what is very important for rail is to have very good internal interfaces to be able, indeed, uh, to have, for example, train pass point-to-point -point crossing border and also to have very good interfaces, for example, to the road transport to be sure that all the intermodal chain is working uh, correctly. And for that, we have a series of IRSs, International Railway Solution, uh, that, uh, if implemented, allows to have these uh, seamless procedures. Thank you very much. And now, staying with rail and coming to the private sector, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Aichon, if you would say a word about what you think are the key priorities for fostering cross-border rail connections. What would be at the top of your list? I think it is uh, indeed uh, to connect the different systems together. Because what you just explained, Francois, is in, in Europe, for example, but also in Australia and in, in East Asia, you have typically different local train protection systems. You have different rules how to homologate an interlocking, a locomotive, a train. You have different electrification systems. You have even different gauges. And, and with that, a system cannot work. So, for example, uh, a European Eurostar train or Thales train or the, the German ICE, he typically has six to eight train protection systems in board in order to travel across Europe. Right. And that's expensive. It is something which is inefficient and, and costs a lot of money to, to, 
put this together, to get the homologation, to get the safety approvals, to keep these systems over a life cycle of 30 years. So um, Europe actually and, and uh, the European Union has, has driven this and have implemented the European train control system. And this is a system which is not only used in, in Europe now, it's used also in the Middle East, it's used in Australia, it's used in many uh, countries of this world. And just in one month, um, the fourth railway package will be introduced that um, uh, will have the possibility for us as industry to only ask one authority in Europe to get the homologation for a train, an interlocking or certain railway systems, and this can then be deployed in all participating countries. And uh, I think seven or eight countries will start uh, June 16 this year, and the remaining uh, EU countries, European uh, Union countries will follow one year later. So this is a good step uh, to bring basically the local historic systems into one seamless interface. Thank you very much. Also for that very concrete illustration with the eight systems. Uh, that's... Uh, it's reality. So. Yeah, <laughs> troubling. <laughs> so let me now come to uh, Madam Inohosa and ask from a customs point of view what you would say are the central challenges to improving connectivity across borders. Um, thank you very much. I would say um, from the customs perspective, um, we've seen um, some major challenges for customs administrations, and, and one of the one of the first um, challenges I think has been a kind of a, a shift or a change in the in the risks that that customs is having to to deal with. If we talked about two decades ago. Um, Customs administrations were very much focused on revenue collection and very trade-specific uh, concerns. Over the last two decades, uh, issues related to safety and security have really increased in, in risk and threat uh, for many countries. And so the, the expanded mission uh, has really added to, to some of the complexities of what customs administrations have to deal with. But also, there's been a, a dynamic change. You look at um, how integrated the supply chains became, right? So uh, before we had a lot of vertical um, um, manufacturing in one country, and then you know, with all of the great things related to, to free trade and, and uh, new markets opening up, um, the manufacturing process became very, um, uh, very dispersed, and so the supply chains are now very integrated across many, many borders. And so uh, the challenges of more, more shipments coming across borders from new countries that maybe before weren't weren't coming through are also a challenge. Most recently, in the last, I would say five. Uh, to 10 years, we've seen also some shifting into e-commerce, and, and that will continue to be an another challenge that um, customs administrations need to face because it's new players, faster moving uh, trade, and um, new places that, that uh, cargo is coming to that we don't always look at the, the proper resourcing and the proper equipment to deal with where the shifting of, of cargo is. Um, and, and finally, I think we also, um, one of the big challenges is as things have gotten so complex, so have also been the demands by, by the importers and exporters for, for rapid delivery. And so this Uber constrained, um, just in time uh, delivery. I think, other than the than the current phenomenon that Mr. Soroka spoke about with regards to warehousing, there's been at least a decade where warehousing was 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 very low because people were doing a lot of just in time deliveries, and so all of that puts added pressure to the customs administrations. And I would say one of the biggest challenges also is a real strong need to work with more stakeholders. I think from, from in both directions, there really needs to be much more connectivity between the various regulators as well as the various layers of stakeholders. If, for example, and just because Mr. Soroka is here, if, for example, uh, LA um, Seaport is going to be expanding their, their uh, operations and they're doubling, I'm making this up, but say you're doubling your operations, Lots of planning and lots of resourcing goes into that, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the resources of the government uh, entities that then have to service that growth. So a lot of areas that I think are, are challenging that we can talk about some more. 
And actually, I'd like to pick up on the point that he made and add another one to it. He talked about the diversion of personnel toward the Mexican border in conjunction with the current uh, situation on that border. Um, is that something that has posed problems for your organization and, uh, or for customs in general? And tied to that, you talked about these twin goals of security on the one hand and efficiency on the other. Does security mean there sometimes have to be trade-offs on speed? I think that um, certainly what we've looked at, we can't have one without the other. Um, what, you know, the realities that we faced after 9-11 and uh, within the World Customs Organization, we developed um, jointly amongst all of the, all of the members the, the safe framework of standards. And what that was, was an increased uh, supply chain security framework that would help um, countries, both stakeholders as well as government regulators, to address the need for increased uh, supply chain security. But at the same time, it included the concept of the authorized economic operator, which was don't penalize everybody for, for these added securities. If you already have highly compliant traders, those highly compliant traders should have a benefit of, of um, for that compliance and get more facilitated trade. Um, but one of the challenges that we have with that, and, and it's not so much related to, uh, to um, security versus facilitation, all of that in order to do a good risk assessment requires technology, requires data. Um, if, if customs administrations have to wait until a shipment is at their door to figure out what the risk is, it's too late. We really need to be able to, to have that way in advance so that the, that the risk assessment is done way before the shipment gets there so that by the time it gets there, a decision has already been made. It's either out the door or, or sent forward for additional inspection. Challenges, you know, we represent uh, customs administrations from all over the world, and so clearly the challenges are, are different depending on the infrastructure that's available in the countries. And one other big challenge related to, to the resource, the human resource, is that some countries don't have a career ladder within the customs administrations. And so part of what really um, leads towards good standardization and harmonization is having some stability of the resources there. And when you have wholesale changes or sweeping changes and the resources that are dealing with these very complex issues that can have a, a major impact on whether whether the resources know their job, follow the, the, the standardized procedures. And I'll stop there because I could talk here for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to do a deeper dive now anyway on customs and border management and talk a little bit uh, about uh, lessons learned in that area. So here are a couple more uh, fast, uh, interesting facts uh, provided by the ITF. Asia Pacific economic cooperation would uh, a trade would increase by 7.5% if all APEC countries would reach the regional average of customs efficiency, would bring trade up by 7.5%. Uh, quite fascinating. Here's another one. Full implementation of the World Trade Organization's trade facilitation agreement would reduce trade costs by an average of 14.3% and boost global trade by up to $1 trillion a year. So quantitative, uh, quantitative assessment of the benefits of trade facilitation. Minister Ahmed, let me come back to you now and ask you about trade facilitation uh, in your ports, because of course the vast <laughs> majority of commerce, uh, both to and from Tunisia, does pass through your port network. Administrative procedures apparently can take significantly longer and cost quite a bit more in Tunisia than in some other neighboring countries. So in terms of that benchmarking, um, what are you doing to change that and to speed up uh, the time and decrease the costs? Okay. Thank you very much. Really, this is one of our concerns. It is precisely the problem of logistics. In concrete terms, the times lost in Tunisian ports when talking about sea transport. The most important port in Tunisia is the port of Radis. 
here we are talking about roughly 65, 70% of the entire trade volume, according to year that uh, enters Tunisia. Historically speaking, it's a port that has never really been developed for being a container port. It was never structured for container trade. The development that has taken place here was not really uh, thought through scientifically. So the way we handle that port, the way that port, port is administered and managed has to change and we're about to change it. We are currently preparing a new management reform that we will then implement in the course of the summer. We use an electronic management system called TOS and it's connected to a system that manages incoming and outgoing goods, smart gates, control systems. We introduced electronic management, and at the end of this summer, we will implement all of it. We're currently in the pilot phase. I believe that this reform will change many things in the port of Radis. This is our medium-term perspective, and then there is another important project that I briefly touched upon before. It will be quite extraordinary for two reasons. The first reason is that the first big port in Tunisia to respect European and international standards, well, we're currently getting ready. We're about to start constructing this port, and that will be run by private companies. We often see that. It's not only the case in Tunisia. The problem is similar in many countries. It's a problem of management. If it is a public company, then we all know what that entails. And the good solution for this new port, which will be a deep water port, is that it is run by a private company. As for the main port, it is today the main port, and then we've got the port of Denfi and other ports, and then it won't be the main port any longer. The new main port will be located right at the center of Tunisia. And we have launched a project to restructure the distribution among these ports. And this will happen then in a way that will allow us to make shipments easier and load and unload containers in a simpler way. I think this is important and we are currently working towards it. I think in the short term we will see many changes also when it comes to new technologies. In the near and medium term future we will see changes and we will have a port by a private operator. We just heard uh, from Madame Inojosa how very important it is, particularly the customs agents, that the human beings who carry out this work have the proper training, that they also, uh, as we adopt new technologies, will be able to use those technologies. Um, so can you say a word about challenges that you face there, perhaps, and what you're doing to meet them? We. Oui. Thank you. Yes, we have introduced a new management system for trade filiation. It's called Tunisia TradeNet. And when it comes to the electronic network, this has already been established. And to it belong our customs authorities, the Ministry of Trade, all the stakeholders involved, um, and they can exchange data electronically. This system has already been introduced. It's up and running for imports and exports. But this is not a customs problem that we have in Tunisia, because here we have a very good training program, and it, it works. First and foremost, in our case, it's a problem of infrastructure. We used to have an unsuited infrastructure. It was just not fit for the purpose of such a large transport volume. And, well, I will be frank about this here. 
the management of public companies, well, sometimes faces a really difficult task. And we're about to make improvements here. I think we just have to improve. And before, I think we briefly touched upon the matter of customs issues across the borders. I think here we would have to mention another important problem when it comes to connectivity, and that's the mobility of passengers. I'm not sure if we have the time for that, but for certain countries, it really is an important problem when we talk about the movement of goods, then everything's fine. But the movement of passengers, people who meet in economic regions or zones, if we cannot facilitate that, then we cannot facilitate the rest. So the countries have to be connected. Ports, and uh, we heard that hypothetical about you doubling uh, port capacity uh, from <laughs> Madame Hinojosa. Um, <laughs> pretty close, he says, exactly. I was going to ask you, what are your aspirations for future cargo, cargo, cargo movements through your gateway, and what prerequisites must be met in order that the border management side of that uh, functions effectively? Well, this can touch now on just about everything that we're doing. Uh, our independent studies show that the cargo volume through our gateway will double within about the next 15 to 20 years, which means simply that we must process more cargo on the same footprint than we've ever done before. And that will come with three areas. One will be around policy, which we've discussed at the top of this dialogue. Uh, the second around process and what we could do better to move, including uh, f trade facilitation. And then thirdly, the investment side. So the aspirations really start with an area that I'm most proud of, and that is the work we've done with U.S. Customs so far. Uh, back several years ago, we met with epic levels of port congestion, just cargo that would not move through and was really plugged up in the system. We began with a dialogue with U.S. Customs in Washington to utilize some of their information in developing our now known uh, port community system called the Port Optimizer. And the request at that time was if we could use generic or non-proprietary information to share with stakeholders earlier on in the transit of this cargo. And thus far, that process has worked extremely well in so much as U.S. Customs now wants their own persona or their own page in our port optimizer so they can plan for staffing, overtime needs, investment in training, and moving people through the system upwardly, and lastly, so they can understand how they are going to examine cargo with a lot more pre-planning that had been done before. So this information sharing notion really has gained a lot of traction. Uh, the other piece is going to be around how we process the cargo and what we do a lot better with it. The numbers are just staggering. We have more than 200,000 companies that use this port on an annual basis. We build 100 trains per day that are no less than two miles in length, and we move about 60,000 trucks in and out of our port per day. So how we coordinate all of that with information flow and that sheer sense of this ecosystem working as a community, we also think is going to further that concept. And then the investment side, uh, many of us have talked for a long time about the investment in infrastructure, the bricks and mortar piece, and that will continue. But it's our belief that investment in digital infrastructure will really play out for millicents on the dollar, a small fraction of infrastructure investments on the brick and mortar side. And without the entitlements necessary, we can put into motion expansion of capacity through digital uh, sharing as well. And I want to come back to that a little bit later. And uh, Mr. Daven, if I don't remember, then uh, help me to uh, come back to what we discussed yesterday with a gentleman who coordinates port activities in uh, Italy and had some very amusing things to say about what's not being done in the digital area but should be. So let me now come to you, though, on another point, which is the question of what your organization can do to promote a common vision for freight and also common customs transit solutions. Okay, what, what, what we are trying to do is indeed to promote this common vision and I want to come back on what was said about uh, the intrication between the American ports and the rail system. If you take in the United States, the model sheet part of uh, rail, it's about 50% if I am not mistaken, meaning that uh, 
this is a very efficient freight system. And in Europe, for instance, it's 18%. So we definitely have to have a, a better organization of our relation. Let's take perhaps two examples. Uh, first example is uh, allocation of capacity, allocation of train pass. For the time being, there is no such animal as an international train pass in Europe. You only allocate national train pass. There is a single window, so you have with, uh, uh, well, you, you address to a single person in the corridor, but you still have a succession of national train pass. So uh, what we are thinking to uh, within our uh, high-level uh, freight group with CEOs is to try to have better procedures to coordinate all those train paths and at the end of the day through collaboration with infra between infrastructure managers and railway operator to have actual international train pass and that's uh, the way through productivity. That's what you have basically in the US. In the US, you have one train pass for 2,000 kilometers, and that, that one train pass, that's very flexible, and we need uh, to uh, be better there. There is a question of the language also, because uh, today uh, you need for the train drivers for freight to have a very good linguistic knowledge. They should be, as far as I remember, B2. Uh, in almost three languages, if you think to the corridors that is going from Germany to Italy. So they need to be uh, relatively good speakers. So we need to have automated procedure, for example, and that's what we are working on, to predefine messages to be sure that the locomotives can be operated with train driver with less linguistic qualifications. So that's very concrete issue that will allow, at the end of the day, to have efficient management procedure. I can imagine new technologies being a solution or at least an assistance in that area as well. So let's come to the new technology uh, issue or do a little bit of a deeper dive on that. And I'll start with you, uh, Madame Un, and ask you quite simply, what is the role of new technologies for you in terms of core network uh, corridors? What are you uh, applying there in the way of new technologies and to what purpose? When you look again, it should be on. I think oh. it just takes a moment to get when the sound. When you look yeah. again at uh, the 10 guidelines, 1315, it foresees that we have this core network and comprehensive network and corridors. They have to be fully deployed with all the uh, new innovation. So that is river information systems, intelligent transport systems. We need, for example, ERTMS, so the, the safety system for, for trains. So this is the, the, I must say it, the objective. Because it is clear when you have more digitalization, when you have better data, it is an opportunity, it has the potential to change the cargo or the freight flows. So, and it, it, it will reduce costs, administrative costs, and it will make everything more seamless and more efficient. So, definitely, this is our aim to deploy all the corridors with these kinds of uh, intelligent uh, systems and digitalization. And when you see also how we are trying to do it, um, maybe for those who do not know it, we have in, uh, linked to the 10 we have the Connect New Facility, which is the infrastructures fund that funds projects in the core network. And what do we do? That is actually only fund very environmentally friendly modes, that is trains, so rail and inland waterways, and sometimes road, but only when it's really cross-border or when it's really a bottleneck. And on top of that, all the digital projects. So we try to fund uh, as much uh, of that, so uh, digitalization, but of course, one more thing also, like alternative fuels, that's also quite important. So everything that is actually uh, the, the basic layer for the future, to have a very resource efficient and digital uh, system. May I ask you just to tell us a, a little bit more about, for example, river information systems. We heard from Mr. Seroka about the importance of pooling data in order that different stakeholders can get a better sense of planning uh, and so on. To what degree do you face challenges in that area in terms of proprietary data? How, how do you foster that kind of sharing without perhaps uh, having some stakeholders say, sorry, we have to opt out on that. It is really a, a huge problem, especially in the Rhine Danube. When you have a, a, a barge trying to sail from Strasbourg up to uh, Constanza in Romania, 
I think that you need 43 different documents in different languages, in different formats. So I think really this is the objective, trying to obtain one document. And uh, in days of now with digitalization, you can have track and tracing. So we shouldn't look at the fact that you are trying to, to, uh, to keep a kind of uh, data that is, uh, that is that should not be shared, you have to really look at how can you try to have an efficient flow and get an agreement on what kind of uh, data that you want to share. And it's not that much, let's be honest. I mean, it's always for the same purpose, that it crosses the borders and uh, let's be honest, I mean, uh, when, when a truck normally can cross the borders in Europe, why should it be different than, for example, for a barge? But apparently that is still a long way to go. And let's talk about maritime as well. I mean, the European Union, every time when it leaves a harbor, a port, uh, it is as if it's coming from abroad. So we really have to still move forward. I want to talk a little bit more about data sharing, but I'd first like to bring Mr. Eichhorn in on this crucial question of new technologies. And I wonder if you can share with us uh, some of what you are doing, uh, both to increase capacity, to facilitate interoperability, and also, quite simply, to make the use of rail more attractive. So I have a couple of examples with me. Um, first, um, in mass transit, and mass transit is a little bit easier than mainline because mass transit typically is a closed environment. There is only a known track and there are only railway vehicles on that track which are all known. And in automatic and in, in mass transit um, systems, we already have automatic train operations, unmanned. So the trains are running without anybody on the train, only the passengers. And with that, we have way better um, capacity increase because the, the system can run much more effective. Second, we have less energy which we use because we can recuperate the braking energy, for example, much better. So there is an increase of approximately 20% if you change from a manned system to an unmanned system and you have an increase of capacity by, by 20%. Second, in the mainline world, it's a little bit more difficult because you normally have a patchwork of technologies. In, in Germany, for example, it's true in many other countries, you are still having interlockings which you manually um, control. And you have on the other side uh, ETCS, which is the latest technology, and you need to be able to manage such a patchwork. So what the countries uh, are doing is, uh, and, and here I, I want to mention uh, Denmark and, and Norway, they have decided to make a country-wide exchange of the technology. And, and uh, this, this is actually, I think, the best approach. It's not so easy to, to make that in a big country like uh, UK or, or uh, the US or, or, or Germany, but uh, in these countries, they really make a con um, comprehensive plan and, and exchange the technology. And for example, in, in Norway, we are now deploying a new system which does not need any more the current about 1,000 signaling houses. There will only be two in the future because it's based on digital technologies, and, and this is a significant benefit. My last example is from the road, and it's actually harbor and, and customs related. Um, there is a harbor in, in Duisburg, which is Duisport. It's the largest inland harbor in Europe. And we have deployed a system which um, connects basically all the trucks with a central database. And in this central database, we know when the ships are coming, and then we can manage basically and tell the truck drivers when do they have to start at their home location. And, and then we guide them to the first uh, area where they can park and then we bring them in because they normally have an arrival, let's say at 12 o'clock, they want to pick up their, their freight, but the ship is delayed or a train is delayed. And then we can tell them in advance, you don't have to start, come only in three hours. And, and this is new technology which is uh, deployed and, and this is a significant increase of efficiency for both the harbor and obviously also for the operators of the freight. So that was exactly the example that Mr. Daven and I heard yesterday uh, from Mr. Mussolino, uh, who manages, among others, the Port of Venice, and told us, I think it wasn't there, but elsewhere, that truck drivers were waiting up to two or three hours uh, in a parking lot uh, with their uh, engines running. And he said, you know, if we can get apps that allow just-in-time uh, transport, why can't we do that uh, with our ports? So thank you for that example. Mr. Daven, 
essentially that goes to the question of multimodality, which is so crucial not only for ports, but in general for seamless connectivity. It's the very definition of seamless connectivity. You've called it everything to everything connectivity uh, elsewhere. How can big data promote that kind of efficient balance also when it comes to triangulating between public transport and freight transport, for example? Yeah, well, I think definitely big data will be part of the solution, but the other part of the solution will be to have the possibility to collect and exchange data. And that's one of the projects we have uh, within uh, UIC, which is called the Future Rail uh, Mobile Communication System. That's mean to have 5Gs on board of the train meaning that the radio part that will be on the locomotive will be able to handle a whole lot of information, meaning that we will can rely on IoT. We will also rely on a positioning, because as you perhaps know, 5G has also a positioning incorporate within, uh, within the specification. And uh, we are preparing, in close uh, collaboration with the European Railway Agency and Europe, the future, system, future radio system. And this future radio system will be one of the enabler to have all this information first collected and then exchange. And exchange with the same kind of uh, specification than the road, because you saw in the different presentations that for the road system, it also will be 5G. So in a sense, FRMCS will break the walls between uh, rail and road systems. So that's for the communication. The second enabler is the modeling. That's exactly what was said by my colleague. Uh, the problem of the railway is that we don't have a common understanding of the modeling. As soon as we have a common understanding of where are the interfaces, I take the example of the different uh, interlocking, for example. We have very different technologies, but basically the interlocking are doing exactly the same thing. If we have, uh, for example, a relatively simple device that just say to the interlocking to do what it has to do without thinking to what kind of technology, and that's today what the kind of problem we have then we can indeed have seamless traffic. But for that, we need first to have a, a modeling of the whole network, and that's a project within uh, UIC, which is called Ray Topo Model, and then to work together. This project is not within UIC, but within some country. It is called EU Links, to have uh, the same kind of, uh, let's say, high-level devices that are telling the interlocking what they have to do. And then you end up with three things. The FRMCS, which give you the data, your EU links that would simplify the interfaces, and then the modeling that give you the possibility to have all the applications that we are talking about. And if you want to give a quite futuristic vision, but that's something, for example, the Swiss are, do, are thinking too, and also in Germany, that the concept of digital twins, meaning that when you have all of that, you can indeed have a modeling of the whole network digitally and then take real-time decision. And if you do that, you increase drastically the capacity, the reactivity, and the resilience of the network. So that's a vision we should have for the future. Very briefly, if you would, uh, perhaps just one more word uh, in regard to Euro-Asian uh, railway corridors, because they clearly are gaining in importance uh, one belt, one road, and so on. What role do you see new technologies playing there in terms of facilitating interface? And will there be challenges in the area, area of data sharing, particularly given the current um, tensions? Well, for the tension, <laughs> that's a little bit difficult to respond to the question, but there is definitely different systems. But we need to work, and UIC is for that a good platform, because our friends uh, well, uh, from Russia, let's uh, uh, call things uh, clearly, uh, they want to have trade with Europe. And now the, the question is uh, definitely how we can have the same model of data, and how we can indeed, for example, have pre-high arrival signals. Uh, that's exactly the same problematic that for Harbor, for example. Because when you will have a shipment from China, uh, well, it will come mostly from Russia, and then the gauge is different. So you need to be sure that you know when the train arrives to make the transshipment. And then you need to have all the information in advance. That will be exactly like uh, what is happening in Harbor. So we need to work uh, with our partners uh, to 
share those information. There is different systems. There is, for example, development, what they call uh, electronic seals uh, di directly on each container, which all the information within those seals and those seals having a capacity to transmit the data. So we are working, for example, within UIC to see how we can use that. Uh, well, pre previously to be in UIC, I was in UTIF, which was also an organization about railway, and we have been working with uh, the World Custom Organization to try to define what kind of transit procedure we could implement for rail. Just a, f a very short word, for rail it's not that dramatic, because in Europe we have a single contract, let's say, extended Europe from Morocco to, uh, let's say, to Iran. That's a very <laughs> big Europe, but we have, the same, we have the same contract there. And then we have another organization that more or less have the same contract, let's say, from Poland and onto China, which is the OSGD. So the situation is not that bad, but we need to work together to have an integration and also with the custom procedure. Thank you very much. Let me ask uh, perhaps a question both to you uh, and to Mr. Siroka in regard uh, to vulnerability through the increasing reliance on big data and security risks that can uh, arise. A port is, of course, critical infrastructure, um, a port in which Big data and artificial intelligence presumably will play an increasing role. Is that a more vulnerable port? And what do you do to address such risks? Uh, first question to the minister and then to Mr. Soroka. Merci. <clears throat> Merci. Moi, de façon, je ne considère pas qui. Thank you very much. I don't think that there is a vulnerability of ports because we have much more to win than we have to lose. And from this point of view, we mainly think of one thing. Of course, we also think about the data problem, but we also think about the real data exchange. But I think that apart from that, the most important thing is finding a solution which makes it possible for us to deploy technology in the solution finding process. I'm thinking about information that can reach out to the left and right because we live in a world where we don't have a choice but to exchange information and data. And this data exchange has to be fluid without any breaks. We live in a world where the exchange of data cannot be something that causes any fears or complexes, because if we're afraid of data exchange, we'll remain stuck in the 19th century, while people will have moved on to the 25th century. Please. Yes, Melinda, this is a, a truly exciting time when we look at the opportunities ahead of us with 5G, LTE networks, spectrum, and how the exchange of data now really is hitting the mainstream but it's also a responsibility and a duty of ours to protect that data. At the Port of Los Angeles, dating back to 2014, we implemented the first ever cybersecurity operations center for a port in our nation. And today, that CSOC, as we call it, is stopping 20 million cyber attacks per month. Just unbelievable. On top of that, and we're very sensitive to government overreach, but we work in the private sector with all of our partners and customers. We introduced last month the first ever Cyber Resilience Center. Think of it as a neighborhood watch, where companies who compete fiercely against each other every day will now begin sharing information about vulnerabilities. But we learned a lot from the energy sector, oil and gas, that we don't want people using or weaponizing this information. We don't want them cross-selling against a weaker competitor. So we're gonna start with a level of anonymity to begin with, and make sure that we understand if there is a vulnerability or something that's witnessed, it's shared across this ecosystem of people who work at the confluence of the port. So I think on one hand, we and many of us have embraced the opportunity of what big data could do and how technology is really moving quickly. But at the same time, harnessing this in a responsible way and protecting our interest from uh, folks that may not be aligned with us. Thank you. Mr. Devon, you had a comment? I, I 
just wanted to say a very short uh, thing is that I, I fully agree with what I said, but the consequence, a very concrete one, is that safety and security in a digital world, that will be more and more the same thing. Great. Because uh, the data, they will access directly to operational things. I was speaking about the interlocking. That means that the interlocking management will be digital. Just imagine what it means in terms of security. Uh, so that will be the same thing. And there's a difference that we have today between safety and security. That's some things that will vanish and we, we need to really uh, tackle those issues together. Thank you very much. I'm eager to open to audience questions, but I would like to ask just one question about hard infrastructure uh, to you, uh, Excellency, uh, in order to get you to just tell us a little bit about quite an interesting project uh, that you have started in Tunisia. And I'm referring to the Border Logistics Center, um, at uh, the one that I know of, Zed Ben Guadane, um, but perhaps uh, you're working on others as well. That is something you are doing to accommodate growing freight flow it's very much about intermodality. Can you just say a little bit about what you're doing there and its impact on trade facilitation? Well, I'd be happy to, of course. If we talk about logistics and trade flows today, then we must not forget that we all have borders to neighboring countries. Sometimes, in trade flows, that means that trade does not always flow according to legal standards. But of course, this is what we want, legal standards that are complied with. But if you cross a border, then sometimes trade is not always organized in the best possible manner. So we have tried to come up with an idea in order to create a structure of a public nature that in trade and especially cross-border trade helps to manage the flows. In that case, we have uh, facilities on both sides of the border that try to facilitate the movement of goods and people. We did start in Figadela, in the south of uh, Tunisia, where we have a border with Libya. A lot of trade takes place there, irrespective of the freedom of movement, of people. But for that kind of trade, we have established something you could compare to a small free trade area. In concrete terms, it means that we pick out individual regions to establish that, which is not always easy. Why is it not always easy? Because borders play a very important role in these areas. Of course, we want to eliminate any trade flow that does not comply with legal standards and want to move it into the legal system. We want to get illegal trade to become legal trade. And in order to do that, we have established our center in Ben Gaden, which is currently being built up. What it really is, is a trade zone where no tariffs have to be paid and where there are no levies across the border. That was our essential idea, because as I've just said before, there is a rather important or strong border between our country and the neighboring countries. And of course, every country tries to manage its borders in the best possible way. Naturally, we cooperate on a daily basis with our partners, that is, with the different neighboring countries. And I believe the solution consisted precisely in establishing these kind of free trade zones so that the informal trade becomes formal trade question, uh, please raise your hand and our microphone uh, porters will bring it to you. It's going to be hard for me to see uh, everybody because uh, we're in the round here. So I will ask the microphone uh, people to please try to keep an eye out for raised hands. Who has a question? Not a one. Don't be shy. Here we go. Okay. We can get one here and somebody back here. Yes. Uh, so could we get one mic here and one mic there? Thank you. 
Go ahead, um, I'll Giles start here. from Strategy and Consulting in the UK. I was just across the panel, but particularly on the maritime sector, as well as perhaps rail. I'm just interested in more commentary around the impact of cross-border trade, particularly around environmental issues and sustainability, and is more cross-border trade a route to lowering the impact of environmental issues in freight and what some of those opportunities actually look like? Thank you very much. I'm going to take the other one as well to get a little bit of a bundle. Um, so if we can, yeah. Thanks, Elio Vicente, International Chamber of Shipping. You, you, you talked about vulnerabilities and data usage, and apologies if I missed it, and you've already covered it. I was in, a, in another uh, event. Uh, but data localization has become really uh, a, a concern for many businesses. So I was wondering what, what your take on that is in terms of its effect on trade and investments, so on and so forth. How, how, is, how is that affecting? Uh, business and investment in general. Thank you. And I have one more here, the young lady in the blue dress. Thank you. Barney Epstein with the World Business Council. Uh, thanks to the panel for a really fascinating discussion. My question to you is that we've talked about data sharing and digitalization and how we can increase the connectivity of trade across borders. Uh, last year, IBM and Maersk were here discussing uh, their blockchain that they're um, rolling out for uh, cross-border freight. And so I'm wondering um, your perspectives on using blockchain as the tool to, to make this connectivity more efficient. Okay, thank you very much. I will put these uh, three questions in the middle and uh, ask who wants to speak to the environmental uh, side. Who has a thought about that? Jean Saroka, please. Francois as well. I, I think with the, uh, the trade as we've seen it and being the largest uh, seaport in North America has given us a platform to discuss this and it's raised the level of influence that we have. In the past 10 years, we've reduced diesel particulate matter by nearly 90%, uh, sulfur oxide by 98%, and nitrogen oxide by about 60. While at the same time, without all the tools, uh, we've reduced greenhouse gases between 20 and 25 percent. Uh, we believe that the more cargo that comes through draws more attention to this matter. And although some of these numbers sound like they're very impressive, on a larger scale they're not. In so much as we have 17,000 trucks that move in and out of our port on a regular basis, yet that would represent only two weeks worth of annual production by North American manufacturers of heavy duty trucks. And when each line costs about two to four million dollars an hour, we also only buy our trucks once every 13 years on average. So we've, in, we've developed a concept called the market maker. How can we be a better customer to those manufacturers so they could advance their areas of discipline to reduce emissions in their business model itself? Okay, their engines, their construct. And with all of that, working with well-capitalized companies, we have found that we have very bold aspirations. By 2030, we want to be a totally decarbonized port with respect to the equipment that is on our facilities to move those shipments around. And by the year 2035, we want to be fully decarbonized with respect to heavy-duty trucks. But we can only do that if we band people together. So we're working with other West Coast ports of the United States, Canada, and Mexico to see if we could be a more powerful buyer of the newer technology. Okay. So all of that goes into the mix on how we think that we have a strong voice in the community. And the environmental strides that we've made over the past 10 years we think have merit, but there still is much more to do, and we believe in that as well. But I think it's a great question. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think Francois Daven also had a comment on the environmental side. Yes, on the environment side, uh, as you know, uh, rail is um, one of the most environmentally friendly mode of transport, but that doesn't mean that we uh, don't have our homework to do. Uh, one of them is indeed uh, to be able to attract more traffic. 
And for that, all what we have been uh, speaking about is about uh, shifting the attitudes to our rail. We need to show that we can be flexible, that we can be efficient. But on top of that, we also have to think to more um, sustainable procurement. That's something that we are uh, dealing uh, with in UIC. And there is also a very promising development with uh, hydrogen, uh, because the first hydrogen trains are already running uh, in Germany. And that means that uh, we could, in the near future, have a completely uh, decarbonized uh, rail network. Uh, because uh, in the area where there is still no catenary, no electrification, we can use those uh, hydrogen, uh, but not very batteries, but uh, units to, uh, to move the trains. Madame Un, thoughts on environmental in terms of inland waterways? It is quite important. Actually, when you have projects for ports in the, on the Rhine Danube corridor, there's always a very strict uh, assessment done, the environmental impact assessment. So it is never, for example, to say that you just need good navigation status so that the barges can sail. It has to go hand in hand with a good ecological status. It, so nature and environment needs to be in balance with uh, the other. So both ways. Thank you. Mr. Eichhorn. I can say something about the technology question. Yeah, please. Um, so obviously we are using all modern technologies, uh, also blockchain, for example, in uh, trying these days to manage uh, parking areas. Yeah? When, you, when you come with a car and you, you have a parking area, you can manage with the blockchain the access and, and uh, the, the time at the end which you have spent over there. Uh, also, we do, for example, artificial intelligence in many areas. We can predict now, uh, because we have sensors in our door systems of the mass transit vehicles, and we can predict when a door will fail. And we can predict that by now, because using artificial intelligence, that we can approximately two weeks before a door will fail, we can say the door will fail, and then we can put it into maintenance process. Or another example in Lisbon, we are using an artificial intelligence algorithm which predicts where the customers will um, take an e-bike uh, from a station and where they will return it. And, and uh, we have an operator in Lisbon, and, and the artificial intelligence is sitting in the cloud, and it's learning when do people want an electric bike from where, and where do they return it. And this includes weather condition, soccer's, soccer events, and, and we actually get paid, or we have to pay a penalty, if there's no bike available, and somebody wants to take a bike, or, which is even worse, if you want to return your e-bike, and there's no space. <laughs> Uh, and then we have to pay a penalty. But this is, uh, new technologies have so many potentials and, and it's incredible what, what we will do, and can do already and will do in the future. Thank you. Um, I'd like to mention on the technology, um, clearly we've been, we've been uh, collaborating with IBM and the Maersk and in their project and some of, and, and following very closely what they're doing in using blockchain to facilitate the movement of these very specific uh, contracted shipments. And over the course of the last year at the World Customs Organization, together with our other partner uh, international organizations, we've worked on um, a study report on disruptive technologies and it covers everything from virtual reality, uh, blockchain technology, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, because our members are doing a number of are trying a number of different things with these new technologies. And, and in this disruptive report, we've captured some of the experiences where our members are, are trying some of this technology. The report will be available after June, so please go to our website and find it. Um, and, and just very quickly, I wanted to mention on the environment, I know that your question was more about sustainability of, of maybe the, the issues related to carbon, but in, in our work, part of our environment program includes um, wildlife trafficking. And so we have partnered very closely with ICAO and IATA, IATA in particular with a number of, of uh, other international organizations to, to get the partnership of who's looking out for the movement of illicit wildlife trafficking um, in, in the air environment and in the, in the maritime environment. And so uh, I think the growing those partnerships really is helping raise awareness of the challenges and, be, and helping us better identify uh, where some of those trafficking situations are taking 
taking place. All the more important in view of the latest findings about endangered species. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, Mr. Deven, I think you had yeah. another question. Yeah, yeah. just a word to emphasize about the use of artificial intelligence, because indeed what is very interesting is that we, we can monitor uh, those different networks, because uh, fleets of uh, bicycles, these are network of bicycle stations that are to interconnect with our mass transit network. And w what is uh, the issue with artificial intelligence is to get rid from our cell phones, because all of that will be dealt outside our um, usage of our own intelligence. That means that all those systems will be working in real time, and that will be quite a revolution in terms of mobility at the end of the day. So I think that that's very important to understand that uh, w what is the real promise of all those uh, networking issues is indeed real-time decisions that the artificial intelligence will do without that we have an intervention to do with, a hub, with an app, for example. We will be ending up this, this, this kind of feature, and that's very, uh, 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 a very important question. And also for blockchain, I think blockchain is something that will be fundamental to have um, modern authentication. So we will have an experimentation within UIC uh, to try to see what blockchain can bring to uh, Euro-Asian corridors. So we hope that we will start this experimentation in the coming years uh, because this authentication question is really key. If we blockchain, we can convince all the states all around the way that's a good authentication system is blockchain, then that will be a huge facilitation for trade. And, and one additional point, obviously, when you have all this data in, in central databases, and we have touched base that before, the issue of uh, data privacy, data security, data safety is, is key to, to solve that. There's a lot of discussion currently ongoing between the providers of technology, the customers, the uh, different uh, stakeholders, uh, how to deal with, with certain data to protect this data, to, to keep it uh, in the frame where you, where you uh, have an agreement about, yeah? because at the end it's an agreement which you, you design, and um, I think it's also important to, to understand and, and uh, work on this area. Thank you very much. I think we would have time for one, maybe two short questions still, if someone has one. I have a question back here. Raise your hand, please. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to, I just want to have a reaction from the panel that crossing the borders, actually you are confronted with many agencies which have different border responsibilities. So the question is, how do you deal with multiple agencies which are operating at the border, which have vertical uh, responsibilities rather than horizontal? Hmm. And that's the reason why I, I once heard uh, Kunyo Mekoria uh, changing the name of World Customs Organization, the World Border Organization. Thank you. <laughs> ah, and when we're here, go. Yeah, please. one more, one more question. Uh, my name is Salvador. I come from Mexico, from the Trailer Manufacturers Association. Uh, a couple of months ago, or a month ago, we had tremendous problems crossing merchandise into the U.S. Lines were as long as several kilometers, tens of kilometers. So uh, my, my question is, what can we do to improve that uh, border crossing with the use of new technology so that the trucks are not waiting for inspections because they can be inspected from the origin or something like that? Thank you very much. Do you want to get us started, uh, Ms. Hinojosa? And uh, then we can take sure, other questions. absolutely. So I, I, I love the comment about um, the multiple agencies at the border and the need, you know, the need to, to figure out how you handle dealing with all those different agencies. Um, it, just to, to make sure to clarify, we, we do um, work with our members on the cross-border movement of people, goods, and conveyances. So that brings in a lot of different um, um, government agencies at the border. Part of, part of what we've been um, doing at the World Customs Organization is helping our members be able to have a more coordinated approach at the border. And, it's, and the concept is called coordinated border management and it, it applies both for the passenger environment as it does for the, for the cargo environment. And that is, we, we actually have a guide that we've, we've prepared for our members wherein we, we talk about 
having com regular conversations, knowing who those, those other agencies are, uh, uh, harmonizing the hours of operation, understanding you know, that what everybody's job is gonna be and how you're gonna coordinate that to make sure that the stakeholders and the users that are, that are using your services have some understanding as well as to when, what opportunities there are for them to submit information in advance and to get um, better coordinated inspections if an inspection is required. So there is quite a bit of work that needs to go on, but the biggest challenge is, is just getting people to talk to each other. And and um, and I apologize to to the, the gentleman behind me who asked the question about the, the uh, border crossing uh, on the southern border. Um, huge challenges there, obviously. Um, in, in, um, I, I spent many, many, many years uh, working uh, in operations on the southern border between the United States and Mexico. And some of the challenges that take place there is that um, there, the, in, in some cases, there's bridges, so there's, there's natural funnels where traffic needs to, needs to go through and you can't really expand those, those funneling areas, so there are some challenges there. Um, I think there's also some really good opportunities to take a look at how, uh, as you mentioned, technology could potentially help. Given the, the, the challenges uh, on the U.S. southern border, um, some of the options for um, inland clearances, for example, in Mexico are challenging. Uh, I, I don't speak for the U.S. government, so I, I can't really go into a, a lot of detail on that. But I think that there are a lot of opportunities. Some of the areas uh, that, that have been tested before are perhaps expanding the hours of operation to provide greater, greater windows of uh, operational uh, opportunities that could perhaps smooth out the, the, the volume peaks in some cases. And I apologize that I'm having to tell you this for, with giving you my back, but... He sees you on the oh, screen okay. now. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> um, so um, there's, there's a number of different opportunities, certainly many more that can be, that can be uh, considered. And the challenges that, that, um, that um, Mr. Soroka mentioned with regards to the current challenges uh, on the southern border, you know, the, the, the government agencies have to make uh, prioritized decisions on where their biggest challenges are. And unfortunately, uh, they're, they are having to rob Peter to pay Paul, you know, right. to use a saying, to deal with some of the other uh, higher priority areas that are currently affecting them. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to add on either of those points? Then I'd say that we will give you a very warm round of applause, all of you, for this very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for being with us. And dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much as well for your attention and your contributions. Again, one wants to turn around in every direction, but uh, it's challenging. <laughs> so thank you for being with us. I wish everybody a great afternoon and evening, and uh, hope to see you a, late, a little later on at the gala dinner. Bye-bye. <laughs>